introduce myself, but, <laughs> um, and then bear with me while I get my slides up. So thank you all um, for those who maybe haven't been on other um, lectures. This is the UCSF Global Child Health Lecture Series. It's an annual event. Um, and uh, we have people calling in from all over the world. It's really fun and exciting to see who comes. Um, so I'm Teresa Kortz, I'm the Pathway Director, and I'm going to be talking today about pediatric sepsis in limited resource settings. As a forewarning for those who don't know me, I am totally fine with long, uncomfortable pauses and silence. So I do want this to be interactive. We have a few things and like polls and things that involve uh, you. And so if you don't talk, I'll just sit here and wait uh, until someone does. Um, and I have no problem with questions throughout interruptions. And I'll say that while I'm presenting, I actually can't see anyone. So I can't see the chat or hands or anything. So just come off mute and, um, and tell, like, speak up. It's totally fine. We, we should make this a conversation. Okay, so let me get my slides going. Um, so I, as I'm doing this, um, I am a pediatric critical care physician, and so I work clinically at UCSF. Um, I also am an NIH-funded researcher, and I study severe febrile illness, primarily in East Africa. Um, and uh, I really got interested in research, mostly because it was a requirement in fellowship. I wasn't, uh, I was interested in global health, but I was not a researcher. But then I got the research bug when we um, did a study in Bangladesh and looked at sepsis outcomes before and after implementation of evidence-based guidelines. The hypothesis was evidence-based guidelines would improve outcomes. And we did the study and we found that it actually didn't. Um, mortality was the same before and after. And actually there was evidence that um, some secondary outcomes like fluid overload were worse um, post-implementation. And this like blew my mind as a fellow um, because it didn't follow any of the mental models that I had for the, um, for the management or the entity of sepsis. Uh, but really led me into this rabbit hole of, well, why didn't it work? And there's so much to it, so much complexity in terms of resource availability and uh, pathogen uh, host interactions. And so I've really built my research career on that. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, pediatric sepsis in resource limited settings. If we have time, because I know it's running up against lunch, um, we'll, I'll try to give you an overview of some of the stuff that I've studied. But if we don't get to it, that's fine. Um, so with that, uh, I'll give you kind of the where are we in terms of what is sepsis, how do we define it, what are the current guidelines, and then we'll talk specifically about um, pediatric sepsis in resource limited settings, some of the barriers, the challenges, and this is very exciting, the controversies. Um, and then, like I said, if we have time, I'll tell you about my work. And I do have a few slides at the end, so just get ready with your screenshot um, with lots of ways to get involved, both in global health, pediatrics, and sepsis work. Okay. I warned you this was going to be interactive. Um, so unlike last week's uh, poll everywhere, now we're going to do everything in Zoom. So if you scroll to the top, you get a drop down menu in Zoom and there's a little pencil that says annotate that's to the right of um, the, the share. Do you see that? So click on annotate and then you can pick um, basically a picture, I think, a stamp and put your vote next to what is your favorite type of chocolate. You can also draw, that's totally fine. No one for white? No white chocolate lovers? No, everyone knows what chocolate is? Yeah, every time I do this, it's phenomenal. Like dark chocolate always wins and I'm a milk chocolate fan. And here's the fun fact for today. Um, so we lived in Switzerland for six months with our kids and my husband and the chocolate there is so good. I think it's the milk. Um, I ate on average two kilograms of chocolate per month, um, which sounds like a lot, but really it just is the average Swiss person eats about nine kilos a year. So I think it just, I'm basically Swiss by now. So anyways, next time you think you eat a lot of chocolate, <laughs> you could feel better about yourself. All right, good. That was a good practice run. And now we know everyone likes dark chocolate. Okay, so let's dive into it. So let's talk about the burden of sepsis to start with. You know, we had known that sepsis was a big problem globally, and there were a few large systematic reviews and things that had come out. 
um, that had tried to get at the burden, but what it was missing was really representation globally. And so there were like huge areas of the world where we didn't have data. And then a landmark paper was published in 2020 um, by the Global Burden of Disease Group. And what they did is they looked at um, both cases and deaths uh, associated with sepsis globally uh, using their normal global burden of disease kind of massive data sets and impu imputation methods. And what was amazing was that they came up with, oh, excuse me, no hearts. Um, what they found was that almost 49 million cases in adult and children worldwide of sepsis in the year of 2017. And two out of every five of those are actually in our patient population, so children under five. And so that meant that there were there are over 20 million cases in, of sepsis every year in children under five. And they also found that there were 11 million deaths worldwide. This is global all-cause mortality. So that means one in every five deaths in the world is associated with sepsis, which is like a shockingly big number when you think about it. More than trauma, more than heart disease, more than cancer, it's sepsis. And in the um, young child age under five, it's about 3 million deaths. So this finally put numbers really to the, the burden that we had previously kind of suspected, but didn't really grasp how large it was. The other thing that was really phenomenal from this study was that um, they found that 85% of both cases and deaths were occurring in low and middle income countries. And that's seen very well by this um, map. And this is from that same paper, the Global Burden of Disease Study. And this is showing deaths related to sepsis, but a map of sepsis incidents essentially looks the same. And so from yellow to blue, that's increasing proportion of all-cause mortality that is attributed to sepsis. And you can immediately see, right, that there are disparities on a global level here. So then the question is really, so then what causes sepsis in children under five globally? And this is um, data from Our World and Data, which is really fun for those who haven't played around with it and looked at it, um, but also from 2017. So the same year that was represented by the Global Burden of Disease Study. You just take a look at it, right? It's low respiratory infections, diarrheal disease, malaria, sepsis, meningitis. And when you look at it all told, like in some, about half of these deaths are actually preventable and treatable infections that can cause sepsis as the final common pathway to death for infectious, um, for infection-related um, mortality. So I've been throwing this term around, sepsis, and it has many different meanings, um, both like official like definitions in, in published literature, as well as what clinically it means. And so I just wanted to stop here and you can vote more than once, but when I say sepsis, whether you're a clinician or a researcher or otherwise, like what does this mean to you? What comes to mind? So using your little pencil annotate again, you can vote. Yeah, so we basically have all of the above, um, which I agree. I think that it's all of these things and that's partially why it makes it so hard to one, identify it and two, define it is because it is really this like spectrum of disease that encompasses so many different ideas. That being said, my favorite definition is um, the one from uh, Singer, at all, the sepsis three definition, and that's life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysre dysregulated host response to infection. And what I like about this is that it shows how severe it is. It talks about the fact that there's multiple organs involved potentially, and that there's something going on, that there's this interaction between the host and the pathogen, which makes it a very unique interaction with each patient and depending on their context. So that's why I like it is because this while it seems like it's a simple definition, it really does encompass how complex sepsis is. And I think sepsis really became uh, um, like a really popular, uh, not popular, but um, became a cause in medicine in the late 1990s, early 2000s, when people realized how many people were actually dying from sepsis. And so there was an international effort to both increase awareness and then to improve outcomes in the early 2000s. And the first surviving sepsis campaign was a group of experts that came together and published um, management guidelines. And this was based on early goal-directed therapy, which 
since that um, has actually been shown not to improve outcomes, but at the time was at the forefront of the evidence-based medicine, it just goes to show how much things can change in 20 years. Um, and, you know, this was mainly targeted for adults. Uh, and occasionally there would be like some nods to pediatrics, you know, pediatric specific considerations kind of buried within the individual guidelines. But we didn't have our own pediatric guidelines until 2000, uh, when finally the Surviving Sepsis Campaign um, published, I know I love the heart too, <laughs> I agree it was about time, um, but they finally published pediatric specific um, guidelines. Um, and, you know, there's 77 statements. Most of the recommendations are based on weak evidence and are based on extrapolations from adult data. Um, so it's very low quality of evidence. And specifically, the recommendations are intended for um, high income countries or settings with um, a lot of resources. And so overall, looking at it, it wasn't anything groundbreaking, except that we finally had pediatric specific guidelines, but it did highlight the lack of primary evidence in pediatric sepsis and the need for guidelines um, for resource variable settings. So I um, I did a, a six month consultancy for WHO um, in sepsis, and I am embarrassed to say that before I did that, I actually did not realize that WHO does not have dedicated sepsis guidelines for adults or children. And so part of the the um, consultancy that I was there for was to start to to start the guideline development process. Um, but the closest thing that WHO currently has and had prior to that process as well were the Pediatric Emergency Triage and Assessment and Treatment Guidelines, originally published in 2005 and then updated in 2016, and we'll get to why in a bit. Um, but these are um, more about identifying the priority signs or warning signs for kids who are critically ill or injured, and then putting them down these like triage and then management pathways. Um, and so sepsis is sort of encompassed in here, um, it, provided that the child meets the priority signs. We also have our PALS algorithm. So for those who are pediatric clinicians, hopefully this looks familiar, um, but the pediatric septic shock algorithm was incorporated, I think in 2015. So it wasn't always there, um, but those are pretty much the what we have for pediatric guidelines specifically to sepsis. Now, what about sepsis and resource constrained settings? Like we've been talking a lot in this lecture series about what are the barriers and challenges to implementation um, and, and like I said, we'll get to a bit of the controversy, which is always exciting, controversy in medicine and otherwise. Um, and I'm going to ask you at the end of it to tell me what you would do with the controversy. So just as a forewarning. Okay. So before the Global Burden of Disease Study, the best estimate that we had for global prevalence of pediatric sepsis came from the Sprout Study. And this was, I think, 126 PICUs globally. Uh, and they found that there was an 8% estimated global prevalence of severe sepsis, but that was for children who were admitted to pediatric ICUs. They also found that within those children with sepsis, severe sepsis, there's a 25% in-hospital mortality rate, which is a lot. If you think about it, if one in four of the children that you were treating with sepsis died, which, you know, this is a global study, it may actually be true when you're getting to the um, severe sepsis um, kind of severity level, but that's a huge mortality rate. To put it in perspective, the inpatient uh, pediatric hospital mortality rate for the U.S. is 0.05%. So this is like orders of magnitude higher. Um, they also interestingly found that there were no significant differences in outcomes between high and low income countries, which I found very surprising. Um, digging a little bit deeper, a couple of things. One, there was only one sub-Saharan African country included, and that was South Africa. And um, they had to be a PICU for inclusion in the study. So they were already limiting their um, sample size to a pretty specific um, uh, group of patients and resource levels. So I work primarily in East Africa and Tanzania and Malawi. And to give you some perspective, we heard um, from the last lecture a lot about Malawi. Uh, so to give you some perspective on Tanzania, there's about 60 million people and about a quarter of that population, a little bit less, lives in poverty. 88% are without access to improved sanitation and 47% without a, um, a, sorry, a clean or improved water source. Um, and there's an estimated 0.1 physician per 10,000 population. To put that into perspective, the U.S. has 25 physicians per 10,000. And then an estimated five out of 100 children will die before the age of five. And that's more than seven times what it is in the U.S. It's also one of the top countries with the highest number of under five deaths. 
And thanks to the Global Burden of Disease Study, we now have an estimate that a third of all deaths in the country are associated with sepsis. So for those who have lived or worked um, outside of the United States, um, and this is a picture from the wards in Malawi, you know, I, I really think that sepsis is different in places like Malawi and Tanzania. Um, and so I want to ask you, what are some of the challenges and barriers that you think exist to managing pediatric sepsis in a setting like this? Lack of consistent access to uh, mechanical ventilation, lack of consistent access to um, vasopressor support, um, lack of training to establish central venous access. <clears throat> yep, I agree with all those. Comment in the chat, IPC, so infection prevention and control. So preventing sepsis in the first place in hospital acquired infections, actually huge. Other I mean, things? Go ahead. Having the like clinicians or just any healthcare provider being able to assess vital signs and um, kind of like early indicators and diagnosis of sepsis. Yeah. And peds, especially nonverbal children, are really hard, right? They can't tell you where it hurts or what's wrong. Any other thoughts? The potential harm of fluid therapy. Yeah. Oh man, that's good foreshadowing. Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, I totally agree. And I think on a bigger scale, having a, a health infrastructure that may be underdeveloped or poorly organized, right? So there's significant delays in presentation and referral. There might not be a formal um, transport system or referral system in the country. And then we talked about resources, but just to expand the idea that resources are everything from people to things to, uh, you know, diagnostics and monitoring, uh, it's all of those things are, um, are resources. We talked about training and education. Peds are difficult. And then I alluded to this before, there's there's something about that like host pathogen interaction that's really um, unique. And so if you think about, you know, what we treat primarily in the United States is more gram negative rod bacteremia or, you know, gram positive line infections as severe bacterial infections. But here we have things that are causing sepsis like malaria, dengue, maybe there's opportunistic infections, and then the host is different. And so think about how malnutrition, HIV, and TB can change a child's ability to fight an infection. And so for all of those reasons, I think sepsis is very different depending on the context you are um, in the world. And so if I distilled it down to kind of the four major challenges and barriers, I think it's identifying sepsis rapidly and accurately, which is what you said, Hannah, and then appropriate and timely referral and transfer. Uh, we also talked about having the resources to identify and treat sepsis appropriately. And then ultimately, do we actually know what the best way is to treat sepsis? So I showed you the Singer et al. Um, sepsis 3 definition, which I love because it's, it's beautiful in its simplicity. This is our current pediatric definition of sepsis, and it's a monster. So, And it also isn't very good. Uh, we'll get to that as well. Um, but it's based on this concept that there's a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So there's underlying inflammation, and that manifests itself typically as abnormal vital signs for age and uh, an abnormal white blood cell count in the setting of fever. If that is occurring, if there's systemic inflammation in the setting of what you think is a suspected or confirmed infection, that then becomes sepsis. And then you have this spectrum of severity from sepsis to septic shock, depending on um, organ involvement and re how refractory it is. Now, the reason it's not a very good definition um, this comes from the fact that it just doesn't identify children very well. And so that's very well demonstrated in this study from Matt Weens um, in Uganda. And they did a prospective cohort of over 1,300 kids who were under five admitted to the ward with a suspected infection. And then they applied this SIRS definition and calculated the prevalence of sepsis. As an aside, um, the inpatient mortality was 5% in this cohort. And what they found was that 86% of children with a fever met SIRS criteria. And so they were, and met, um, and met criteria then for sepsis. Um, and the sepsis criteria did identify 61 of the deaths. However, um, so while it was quite sensitive, so 95% sensitive, it wasn't very specific, only 15%. You can see that the positive predictive value is only 5%. So what this means is that 
It's highly sensitive, so it's very good at identifying the children who died, but it is not very good at identifying those um, who had infections, who had sepsis. So it's it's too sensitive to actually be useful in this setting, and it doesn't really tell you um, or predict who is going to die. So it's, it has limited utility, and that's one of its the major criticisms of the SIRS um, definition for pediatric sepsis. Then we have the barrier to appropriate and timely referral and transfer. And this was a study out of South Africa and they essentially followed critically ill children from the time they presented until they reached the PICU or the emergency department or died. And they had an expert review the medical records and try to determine overall quality of care and if there was some avoidable severity of illness or admission or death. Um, and then they tried to identify modifiable factors. And they had over 300 children enrolled and you can see this is looking at the different places where children first were first presented. So the city health clinic, 24 hour clinic, hospital district level, um, the RC is the, it's the, uh, what is it? The Red Cross women in, I think, uh, children's hospital, something like that, but that's the essentially the tertiary care level center. Um, and overall, um, they found that there were 250 emergency and PICU admissions and 30 deaths and global quality of care was actually rated at as good in only 10% of cases, so not very good. And they found that there were major modifiable factors, things like access to care, identification of who needed to be referred and who was critically ill, assessment of severity appropriately, um, inadequate resuscitation was another one, and then delays in decision-making and referral. And so overall, they actually thought that um, PICU admission was avoidable in over half of the children, and that death was probably avoidable in three quarters of children, which is kind of shocking um, and concerning, especially because you think going back to health systems Sub-Saharan in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, broadly, South Africa and Cape Town um, tend to be have better and stronger health systems. And then we talked about the barrier um, of having just resource availability. And so this was an anonymous questionnaire. It was uh, given out to anesthesia providers across primarily Africa and um, Europe. And they wanted to, the, all of the items were trying to evaluate availability of resources just to implement, implement the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. Like it's great to have guidelines, but if you can't, if you don't actually have the tools to implement them, they don't really do much good. And so this is kind of a busy slide, so I'll break it down for you. The top half is looking at African countries versus high-income countries and how they responded to whether they could do the entire bundle or pieces of the bundle. And then the second panel at the bottom is looking at just within Afri the African continent, Sub-Saharan African countries versus South Africa, Mauritius, and North Africa. And just to say that of African countries, only one and a half percent could actually implement the surviving sepsis guidelines in entirety compared to 82 percent in high income countries. And when you look at sub-Saharan Africa, it drops to 1.2 percent. But overall, across the continent, it's still less than 7 percent. So now I ask you. I pulled these boxes straight from the pediatric guidelines of surviving sepsis campaign. And I just, if you want to either come off mute or try to circle again with the annotation feature, tell me what some of these things you think might, um, might have significant barriers to implementation depending on resource availability. Yes, but which part of them? <laughs> you can't check them all. <laughs> yes, I agree. I feel like for the one in the middle, I don't know what the availability of nitric oxide is within the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty resource intensive. You have to, and expensive. So yeah, definitely. ECMO, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Renal replacement therapy. So that's another uh it needs a um, high level of training and understanding expertise. You need to have a sterile environment, a sterile water source, uh, and then you need to be able to actually make the dialysate. So there's multiple levels of expertise related um, to that. Totally agree. Even things like non-invasive mechanical ventilation or invasive ventilation, um, being able to do lab uh, work, whether that's going to a central lab or even doing like point of care tests, 
Um, and then things like hemodynam hemodynamic monitoring, like cardiac index, SVR. Honestly, we don't even do that usually in, um, in kids in ICUs here. And then source control, right? So source control means that you have to have someone who in many cases knows how to drain an abscess or place a chest tube. Um, hopefully if it's simple and straightforward, it's simple in antibiotics, but it isn't always the case. So do you have a pediatric surgeon? Do you have a pediatric anesthesiologist? So yeah, when you start to look at this, you know, it's nice to make a guideline, but if you can't actually implement it, it doesn't do a lot of good. So I agree. Um, it's great to have guidelines. Uh, they're, they just aren't widely applicable in the current state, or at least globally applicable. So I agree. I highlighted the ones here that um, I thought were resource intensive. So now, now we get to the controversies, which is really exciting um, because it's ongoing and we haven't figured it out yet. Um, so this is the original WHO ETAC guidelines, so the 2005 version that I told you about. And you can see that it actually parallels the original, well, original, this tells you how old I am, kind of pre-2015 PALS guidelines, which was basically 20 mLs per kilo rapid bolus as quickly as possible. And if that doesn't work, do it again. And if that doesn't work, do it again. And that makes sense if it's a U.S. population, because we have pretty good evidence that aggressive early fluid resuscitation, even if it's started by community providers like pre-arrival to the hospital or the emergency department, can decrease mortality. When I say aggressive fluid resuscitation, we're talking about more than 40 mLs per kilo in an hour, and that was strongly associated with survival. And conversely, they found that inadequate fluid resuscitation um, was associated with the highest risk of death. And so kind of our love of fluid um, really came from some of these like fundamental studies in the US. In, but it's context dependent, which is where this is very interesting. So in Brazil, they did a study with rapid high volume fluid resuscitation within an hour and found um, that again, there were decreased odds of mortality. In Colombia, they did this combination of like early rapid fluid resuscitation and found actually that the children had less respiratory failure. But in India, they did something similar where they did rapid versus kind of a slower fluid resuscitation. Um, and the kids with the slower fluid resuscitation um, uh, did better from a respiratory standpoint. So this is all kind of like mixed. It's like, what am I supposed to do? And then we have like the study of all studies that really kind of set the, I would say the, the global pediatric critical care field kind of on its head. So this is a this is the FEAST study, and it is a landmark um, trial that's now over a decade old. If you haven't read it, you should in pediatrics because people will still refer to it. Um, and it is, for a pediatric study, a very large multi-center randomized control tr trial because it involved over 3,000 kids, and it was all in children um, in Africa with shock, either compensated or decompensated. So they had different arms, and they were randomized to receive a normal saline bolus, albumin bolus, or no bolus. What's very interesting about this study is that they originally designed it to be a head-to-head -head competition between normal saline and albumin, and kind of at the last minute, they decided to add this like control arm of no bolus. And what they found, interestingly, was that a bolus, whether it was normal saline or albumin, had earlier reversal of shock, so normalization of vital signs and also increased mortality. So the relative risk of death of getting of having received any fluid bolus was 1.45, and it was statistically significant. So if you got fluid of any kind, you were more likely to die. And they actually, they found that this excess mortality was consistent across all subgroups. So in those with malaria, coma, anemia, and acidosis. So this is shocking. So the kids who came in with compensated shock who didn't get a fluid bolus actually survived at a higher rate than those who didn't. And so this is the opposite of what we had been doing um, and what the PALS algorithm and WHO guidelines up to that point had recommended. And there's a couple of like interesting hypotheses for this. And this is why we haven't totally figured it out yet. So we, what are the hypotheses is that rapid fluid resuscitation in someone who is clamped down and cold um, could be causing reperfusion injury. So similar to post-transplant or post-MI when you have um, an area that has decreased or low blood flow and then all of a sudden you open up very quickly, that can cause a sterile inflammatory process. There's also the thought that um, there's myocardial, secondary myocardial dysfunction, secondary to a worsening acidosis. Um, and that in specific patient populations, so those who are anemic, malnourished, or malaria positive, there might be increased capillary leak or third spacing, so essentially fluid overload. 
And that fluid overload could look like different things. So it could be increased intracranial pressure, it could be respiratory failure, myocardial dysfunction. Um, and all of these could be very detrimental if you don't have um, intensive care facilities or services to essentially rescue people. So mechanical ventilation, can you give dialysis, even Lasix, do you have inotropes? So it's all very interesting. Uh, I'm still totally fascinated by this. And then the same group did a post-hoc analysis of the feast data a couple of years later. I have to tell you, like when this paper came out, it was a bombshell and people, um, you know, there were people who believed the, the results and others who didn't, the naysayers. And I think over the last decade, we're finally all like, we finally believe that the, that the data are real, um, but still don't understand what the underlying mechanism is. So in this post-hoc analysis, they took the same cohort of children and then they um, analyzed what the mechanism for death was. So essentially from clinical criteria, because there weren't autopsy results, could they determine from the chart review alone, how did the patient die? So did they die from shock? So cardiogenic, was it neurologic? So essentially elevated ICP, or was it respiratory? So did they have um, respiratory failure because of fluid overload? Uh, yeah, thank you. I think it's a good paper too. Um, so you can see what they've done is they've combined the albumin and normal saline bolus together. Um, and that's in, it's a little bit hard to see from the pictures, um, but it tends to be uh, the lines that are a little bit closer together um, for each of those subgroups versus no bolus. And what I find very interesting is this difference between the cardiogenic like final terminal event um, in the bolus versus no bolus. And those who had received a bolus were more likely to die of shock than the children who did not receive a bolus, which is very interesting because if you remember two slides ago, I said that those who got a bolus actually had reversal of their shock and yet they're still dying of shock later on. So this is just like very interesting. And again, like we don't have all of the answers to what's um, underlying this, um, but just to say that it is a controversy and we haven't figured it out yet. So I will ask you now, I've just given you data from around the world on fluid resuscitation, as well as our current active pediatric guidelines. So would you change your practice? You can use the annotation to vote. You can come off mute. Ooh, no no's, okay. So Christina, I'm gonna um, ask you, how will you change your practice? Um, I, th I would definitely uh, resuscitate much less aggressively than um, the original kind of protocol demanded. And question for you, would it make a difference if you are, for example, when you worked in Uganda versus when you're working in Oakland? Does that change how you would approach this? Probably. Um I think that obviously we want our research to be generalized, generalizable, but, um, you know, we're, we're learning more and more about how different, you know, populations and places have very different genetics and different responses to things. And so I think it's totally appropriate to recognize that different contexts may, might have different, you know, responses to management, but I also would love, uh, you know, to kind of keep looking at this and, and try and, maybe do some studies that can be normalized across multiple sites to see whether, you know, how, how that holds up. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, you are not alone. So your response is essentially what the global response was, which was, huh, maybe we need to think about this differently and think about our approach based on the available resources. So that's why the WHO actually up, um, updated their guidelines in 2016. And what they said was, so children who are not in shock, and th they define shock as needing all three of the following, so impaired circulation, cold extremities, cap like delayed cap refill, or a weak and, a weak and fast pulse. So you have to have all three of those to be in shock, which is, I think, a higher bar than we would probably normally use um, like here in San Francisco. 
So if a child is not in shock, they should not receive a rapid infusion of fluid, that they can get maintenance IV fluids if they're not tolerating PO. And then there's this focus now on this reassessment piece. So you can't just like start fluids and like walk away. You have to come back and see how they're tolerating it. And ideally that's within an hour of starting the fluids. Now, if a children has all three of those signs of impaired circulation, then they should get 10 to 20 mLs over 30 to 60 minutes. So now we have like a wider range of fluid and it's over a large, like a much longer period. Remember originally it was like 40 mLs per kilo over an hour, like as fast as you could. Um, so that's different. And again, this focus on reassessment. And now if they're still in shock, you can repeat it. But again, a, a smaller amount of volume over a longer period, or if they're not in shock, you move to maintenance IV fluids. And there's some specific considerations based on the patient population. So if they have severe anemia, then you should transfuse them um, and give them maintenance IV fluids and not boluses in the meantime. And then for those with severe acute malnutrition, it's an even smaller volume over a longer period of time. And this is a group that you definitely want to watch carefully for fluid overload because their overall oncotic pressure is, is lower. Um, and then definitely there's also a move to um, orally rehydrate when possible in dehydration. So placing an NG tube um, as opposed to doing IV fluids. Teresa, is this are these new guidelines based on any trials or this is basically just a response to feast showed that we shouldn't resuscitate rapidly. So we're just trying to walk it back. Yeah. So they revised. So Feast was published in 2011, a huge uproar. Like people were very angry about it initially, I'll tell you. Um, but in 2015, WHO had to come together and like relook at things. So they reanalyzed the data and did like a systematic review. And it wasn't just fluid resuscitation in the updated guidelines. They also looked at, I think like hypoxia and some other like things that had changed. So they did a, a re-review of the current literature. And based on that review, you know, there were no other randomized control trials in children in resource variable settings. There still aren't of that size. So that became a strong, like the FEAST trial did play prominently in the rewriting of the guidelines because it was such, you know, compelling evidence. Yeah. So yes, in response, partially, if not entirely. And it even made it to the PALS guidelines. So for those who have trained maybe more recently, you don't know that this, this did change in 2015. Um, so before it was like back-to-back -back fluid boluses, you just keep going at 60 mLs per kilo in one hour, then you reconsider um, if you need to add a vasopressor. Um, but that's different now. And so if you actually look at the AHA guidelines, um, so we say, you know, we know isotonic flu fluids are the cornerstone of therapy. However, and then this is the FEAST trial that they're referring to, a large randomized control trial of fluid resuscitation conducted in a resource-limited setting found worse outcomes for children in settings with limited access to critical care resources. So use extreme caution. It could be harmful. Use individualized treatment and frequent clinical reassessment. Great. So we're back to not totally knowing what to do, but at least we acknowledge that things are different. And I will say... One of, to their credit for the surviving sepsis campaign, this is their pediatric guidelines. And what they did is they made um, kind of this branching algorithm based on whether their your, the healthcare system has intensive care or not. And if intensive care is present, and essentially you could rescue children from you know the downsides of over resuscitation with fluid, then you go down kind of the classic PALS algorithm of 40 to 60 mLs per kilo in an hour. But if there isn't intensive care, then they kind of went more of the ETAT route. So if there's no hypotension, don't give fluid boluses. Um, and if there is, you can give a lower amount of fluid over a longer period of time. And then again, with this like focus on reassessment. So I do think that the mindset has changed, the mindset that there's this like one size fits all for um, sepsis management. Um, and I think that the, the place where this became the most evident was in fluid resuscitation. I think it's applicable in more... Um, in more of our management strategies than just fluid resuscitation. Okay, so that was a lot. So what do we actually know? As I told you a lot about what we don't know. Well, so from our study, from the study I showed you from Uganda, we know that the current pediatric sepsis definition is actually not very good because it's not applicable. Um, it's too sensitive and nonspecific. We looked at the study from South Africa and 40% of the critically ill children were evaluated. I didn't show you this, but 40% um, but of the critically ill children were actually evaluated by at least one provider before they made it to a tertiary care center. So again, showing that delays in presentation within the health system itself um, can lead to increased mortality. 
And then from the survey of anesthesia providers, um, sepsis guidelines can't really even be implemented because of a lack of resources. So it's not an issue with knowledge, it's actually all resource-based. And then from the FEAST trial, that mortality was higher in the inter intervention group. Um, and so this really raises questions about this one size fits all and do are we giving um, children the appropriate treatment for sepsis? So I like to zoom out because it's always good to remember kind of where we've been, where we're going, and like what it is that we're trying to do. And so for me, in the the my research kind of program is to find the optimal management of pediatric sepsis. And I think that it is highly dependent on the contextual setting and the patient population, again, going back to the importance of the host pathogen interaction. Um, yeah, sometime. So I'll spend probably about 10 minutes just telling you kind of like high level of the work that I've done to start to parse this out. Um, and the various different sites where it works. So one of um, one of our study sites is in Tanzania, and we did a study to identify pediatric sepsis patients who are at high risk for mortality. So this was a mixed methods prospective cohort study. We screened uh, over almost 10,000 children over the course of a year and identified um, 2,000 children who met SERS criteria, clinical SERS criteria for sepsis, and then we followed them for hospital outcomes. Um, and you can see that we actually had some that were lost to follow up, about 228. We had 203 in hospital deaths and 1,600 survived to discharge. And then we did do 28 um, day follow up um, with those who were discharged for mortality and morbidity. Um, and so the sepsis criteria that we used, because of resource limitations, we had to adapt it so that it was based on clinical criteria and no lab based criteria. So you can see how we um, kind of a adapted it there. And overall, in-hospital mortality was 11%. If you remember the study from Uganda with a slightly less sick cohort, it was 5%. And then you compare that to the Sprout study, which was 25%. But remember, that was as a very, that was a significantly sicker population because it was severe sepsis. And the children had to have been admitted to a PICU. These were children who were just admitted to, um, who were presenting to the emergency department. So overall, um, we tried to use clinical scores and not laboratory-based measures um, to determine uh, a severity of illness. And so all of these have been uh, developed and validated in resource-limited settings and in malaria endemic settings. And I wanted to know, you know, if we tested these available clinical scores that were specifically designed for resource-limited settings, how well did they predict mortality in a sepsis cohort? And it turns out, not very well. So the LOD score, which is like a simple score and just three clinical sides um, for the area under the receiver operator curve, it was only slightly better than a toss of a coin. The six score performed the best within um, area under the curve of 0.78, but the PDS score, which is actually developed by the FEAST investigators was just mediocre. So that kind of leaves a lot to be desired in terms of how do we find, how do we identify the children who are highest risk of mortality? And so we're currently working on a model that combines clinical signs and point of care biomarkers as a prediction, uh, prediction tool for mortality. And then I also wanted to know, well, what's the source of sepsis? And so if we, um, we looked at all of the available diagnostics at Muhambili um, National Hospital, which is where the study was located. So for example, a chest x-ray that was positive for a low bar pneumonia, um, doing uh, diagnosing malaria, and we combined both RDT and smear because um, smear was not reliably done. Um, and then uh, culture positive, uh, blood culture to diagnose bacteremia, urine culture um, for UTI and meningitis through a CSF culture. And so what you can see is a couple of things. So one, we didn't identify an actual definitive source very often, so only in 10% of cases. And um, for those who know the sepsis guidelines, the, there's that golden hour where you want to get um, antibiotics in, and ideally you get cultures drawn before that. Um, we really weren't, we aren't drawing cultures routinely. And Annika talked about this in her um, talk on antimicrobial resistance last hour or two hours ago. And part of that is just the barriers to actually getting the cultures. And so overall, this means that we're not, uh, we don't really have great diagnostics at Moving Billy to identify um, what the source of infection is. And even when we do have those tools, we're not using them um, regularly. And unfortunately, even when they are being performed, they're insensitive. 
So lots of barriers. Um, what I didn't show you here is that 43% of the children had received antibiotics before they reached Muhambili, which probably contributes to the insensitivity of the test. So now we're going to shift and go um, to Malawi. Um, so on this concept of, you know, how can we use biomarkers for diagnosis, and especially in malaria endemic regions, which add an extra layer of complexity, I wanted to look at biomarker profiles in children with malarial sepsis and non-malarial sepsis. And so we use um, point of care biomarkers pretty frequently in the emergency department, in the ICU, you know, procalcitonin, CRP, um, IL-6 um, to determine if, you know, kind of where the child is on the spectrum of severity of illness and whether we should start antibiotics or stop them. In resource constrained settings, clinicians oftentimes are limited to just the clinical symptoms and signs. And what's really tricky is that malaria can both cause sepsis and also mimic sepsis. Um, so you have these like overlapping pathophysiology and clinical features, which make them really difficult to kind of differentiate. So we did a secondary analysis of a cohort of children who had presented to an outpatient clinic in Blantyre. And there were um, essentially three different cohorts, those with malaria, um, those with non non-malarial fever and those who were healthy controls. It wasn't interested in the healthy controls for this analysis, so um, don't worry about them. All of these kids were under five. They were previously healthy, so they didn't have HIV or severe anemia, chronic illness. They weren't altered, so it wasn't cerebral mal malaria. And then of those for who, of the febrile children for whom we had available sera, we then classified them as having sepsis or not having sepsis again using that um, simplified SERS criteria. And then within the sepsis and no sepsis groups, we further categorize them as having malaria or not having malaria. So we ended up with these four distinct clinical um, groups of, of patients. So those with only malaria, those with non-malarial fever, those with malarial sepsis and non-malarial sepsis, and then looked at their biomarker profiles. Um, both pro and anti-inflammatory biomarkers at the time of presentation. I'm not gonna show you all of that data, just the highlights from it. So we did find significant di differences in biomarker concentrations when we looked across those four illness groups. So you can see there's one panel, the IL-1 beta shown here, and you can see those four illness groups, again, malarial fever, non-malarial malarial fever, malarial sepsis, and non-malarial sepsis. Um, but malarial fever and uh, malarial sepsis essentially have the same profile against for all um, biomarkers except for IL-1 beta. And really the difference that we were seeing in biomarker concentrations was being driven by uh, malaria, not by sepsis. And we know that because we did um, comparisons both across and between groups and then also tested for interaction. We did not find a malaria sepsis interaction. We also did not identify a sepsis specific biomarker profile. What we were able to do though, was to um, combine the IL-1 beta, which was a pretty um, well-performing single biomarker with uh, the weight for age Z-score as a marker of malnutrition and then malarial status. And we were able to um, increase the area into the receiver operator characteristic to 0.77. So it's slightly better than most of those clinical scores or slightly better than the six score that I showed you and better than the two other clinical scores. So we do get some additional benefit from adding this um, biomarker. It still isn't perfect and I would love it to have a higher sensitivity and specificity, but that is for the next study. And then I want to tell you about our work in next generation sequencing. And this is actually a study that um, my collaborators and mentors did in Uganda, and we're doing something similar right now in Tanzania. Um, but this uh, enrolled 94 febrile children at the district hospital in Tororo, and they collected uh, blood samples on the febrile children. They did nasal pharyngeal swabs and stool samples. And these were, again, under five children. They had a fever. They were hospitalized for an acute illness. And the top reasons were gastroenteritis, pneumonia, sepsis, malaria, upper respiratory infections, kind of the usual players. And of those who had blood samples, 13 tested smear positive for malaria. The other 80 were negative. And then all biospecimens underwent RNA extraction and metagenomic next generation sequencing and then bioinformatics analysis and pathogen detection via the um, path, uh, the um, pipeline at Global IDSeq, or actually I think it's um, CZ IDSeq now. And for those who don't know next generation sequencing, do not feel bad. <laughs> it is not um, something that we all regularly talk about. But what it is, is a very innovative and unbiased technique to do pathogen detection. And so what you do is you take a patient sample. And so that could be blood, it could be CSF, it could be nasopharyngeal swab, and then you extract the nucleic acid. And that could be RNA or DNA. 
It's RNA, you reverse transcribe it and get a complementary DNA. And then you, you create a sequencing library. And so essentially, if you have any fragment of genetic material of any potential microbe that's in there, you will end up sequencing it. From that point, you move from kind of the wet lab, so the actual laboratory, to the informatics pipeline. You take out all of the noise. So you can see you move, remove the human reads. Um, you align the sequences that you've um, that you've sequenced in your library to reference databases. So publicly available online in the cloud are all everything that's ever been sequenced. And so you can look and see how much those sequences overlap. And then you're able to actually say, oh, this is similar. This is similar to this and it's related in this way and actually then identify microbes. And this is great because a few reasons. One, it uh, isn't affected by pretreatment of antibiotics. Um, so even dead uh, bacteria that have been killed, lysed by antibiotics, will still have some genetic material rolling around in the blood, which means you could identify it by next generation sequencing, even though the culture might be negative. And so in this study, what they found was that the most common pathogens identified in the serum were malaria. Now, what I this is a heat map, and so you can see the columns represent individual patients, and then within each column, you can see along the left-hand column the individual potential pathogens that were identified. Um, and then the coloring is like it's a heat map, so the darker the purple, the higher the reads per million, which essentially is a stronger signal. Um, what I've also shown here with the asterisks are the... Uh, subjects who tested malaria smear positive. So just to speak to the sensitivity of the test, um, this is ca this is capturing potentially you know three times more of the PFAL cyprum infections. This brings up lots of questions about like submicroscopic malaria and whether these kids were sick from malaria or something else. Um, but the caveat to that or the counter argument to that is all of these children were hospitalized with a febrile illness and very few of them had another potential um, secondary pathogen. Um, and then for the nasopharyngeal swabs, um, it was actually common players. So it was things like rhinovirus and um, RSV. So just to say that those really are universal. Um, so again, kind of summarizing the work that I've done so far. So in Tanzania, we know that the current approaches to determining high-risk children are inadequate. So we need better scores. We need to identify kids um, who are high risk for mortality. And then in Malawi, we looked at um, biomarker profiles, and there is some evidence that adding biomarkers could improve the diagnosis of sepsis, and especially in malaria endemic regions, which really do add an extra layer of complexity. And then I think that there is a role for next generation sequencing and improving pathogen detection for many of the barriers that we talked about. So our current um, body of work um, is that we're enrolling children with severe febrile illness, and we're using both point of care biomarkers and then um, doing exploratory biomarker analyses on plasma, as well as next generation sequencing to um, see if we can identify the children who are at risk for decompensation and highest risk for mortality with the point of care. And then using the next generation sequencing um, to identify um, ideally the pathogen um, that's the cause for the severe febrile illness. We're also doing um, you know, routine and locally available tests, so malaria testing, HIV, um, microbial culture, and comparing the results between them. And we're about halfway through um, in our enrollment, so stay tuned. Maybe next year I'll have some preliminary results to share with you, um, but really keeping in mind, again, like zooming out to the big picture, like the science itself is very cool and exciting, um, but the end goal is to have a sustainable, relevant, and feasible intervention that we can actually use in a resource-constrained setting. And that's really where that role for point-of-care biomarkers I'm hoping will come in. Any questions or comments before I uh, put in some plugs for other things and ways to get involved? Okay. So for those who haven't done residency yet and are thinking about it, um, UCSF does have a global health um, pediatric uh, global health pathway, which is this global health lecture series is part of it. Um, and it's a three-year pathway. So there's an opportunity to do global health coursework, a mentored global health project, to really have a global health community at UCSF um, and opportunities to present your work. If you are interested in thinking about a critical care fellowship, we also have the 
critical care medicine global health program. This is a four-year program that's really designed for people who want to do an academic career in global pediatric critical care. Um, and so it does meet, it meets all of the basic fellowship requirements. And again, you get to do a longitudinal global health oriented fellowship project with mentorship from both critical care and global health experts. Um, if you're interested at all, let me know. Um, we actually have a couple of people in the pathway right now who could give you real life experience and um, their unbiased opinions as well. And then other ways to get involved um, in sepsis kind of at large. So World Sepsis Day happens every year. Um, the Global Sepsis Alliance, it was just actually last week. They usually have a huge event on September 13th. And a lot of it is virtual now. And then they usually do a half year event. Um, so just go to their website. You can get on their mailing list. And they have great talks from you know experts around the world. WHO um, will come and speak at the events. And they're free um, for everyone. And then I'm happy to say that WHO is, uh, who, when I was there, we had to stop development of the sepsis guidelines because COVID happened, um, but they are now actively uh, working on those sepsis guidelines. And um, the goal is to have them to be broadly applicable across resource settings. Um, and then with PICS, which is the World Federation for Pediatric Intensive Critical Care Societies and the Surviving Sepsis Campaign are also actively revising the pediatric sepsis definition. I'm hoping that that will come out soon because it's been in the works for a while. And then if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, so look at NIH funded studies, um, there's over 70 now of pediatric sepsis trials that are ongoing. And many of them are looking at fluid type and resuscitation. There's one that's out of CHOP right now. And I think another one that's um, uh, the Canadian Trials Network. So we're, we're getting the, the evidence and the data, we're getting there. And then this is the screenshot, um, <laughs> the screenshot field you want or slide. So there's lots of ways in, uh, to get involved in sepsis work, research, advocacy. Um, you know, these are different conferences that have different subgroups where you can find other people who are interested in this type of work. Um, so you can go to these websites and find um, as well. Ooh, Annika, what's happening at Open? Oh, they're, they're a site for the, oh my gosh, no, I can't even think of the name of it. What was the name of it? Where they're comparing resuscitation with normal saline versus LR. In the, in the emergency department, right? Yeah. It's like a EFIC study, like, um, where they get randomized before consent for emergent cases of anyone who basically meets criteria for, um, emergent fluid resuscitation, um, for sepsis specifically, like not for other like dehydration or anything else. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. See, um, it's awesome. It's happening here. <laughs> so great. Um, and there's like a huge amount of thank yous. This is, um, the, you know, a just a few of the people who have really like helped. And just to say too, that my mentors and collaborators in Tanzania and Malawi are instrumental. It could not have ever done this work without um, having them as excellent partners. Um, so thank you all. Um, any questions that you haven't had a chance to ask, put it in the chat. Oh, Prompt Bolus, that's right. That is a clever name. Prompt Bolus is the randomization normal saline versus LR that's happening in sepsis patients who present to the emergency department. Hi, this is um, Sumant. I'm the second year PEDS ID fellow at Maryland. Um, I, th th this was really, really amazing. Thank you so much. Um, there were um, a couple of questions that I had. Um, the first one was regarding um, like point of care lactate. Um, I know that there was a secondary analysis of the FEAST trial um, that looked at that question and showed uh, like an association with failure to clear lactate um, being associated with higher mortality rates. Um, so I, wanted to see what your opinion was on collecting point of care lactate, whether it was feasible, what situations it would be appropriate in. Yeah, so I'll tell you that the four biomarkers that we're doing um, currently are CRP, procalcitonin, lactate, and ferritin. And I don't know if you're familiar with Joe Carcillo's work um, on sepsis, but he's got, a, you know, like a I can't remember how he describes it, but it's essentially like a prediction model that just looks at CRP and ferritin um, levels. And it was highly predictive of, um, of mortality in a sepsis population in, PIC, in the PICU. Um, it's a relatively small sample size, but it was pretty compelling evidence. So that's how ferritin kind of got in there. So yeah, we are actually testing lactate, but I'll say the, the 
evidence for lactate is pretty mixed. Even with the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines, they didn't, for peds, they didn't make a strong recommendation one way or the other to follow lactates for um, for perfusion or for like kind of goal-directed therapy because of the lactate the evidence is just lacking. And then I know from um, Andrea Conroy, who works in Uganda, and then um, Matt Weens, who also works in Uganda, they have previously looked at lactate and said it just like actually wasn't very predictive at all. And so they've stopped measuring it. So we'll see. Um, I, uh, I put it on there because we use it so much in critical care, um, but I'm less excited about it um, as we go along. Thank you. And then um, I guess I wanted to get your opinion on the use of bubble CPAP um, in resource limited settings for um, uh, PARDS associated with sepsis. Um, I know that there's um, like some studies that suggest that it may not be um, as beneficial as previously thought, especially when there isn't close monitoring. So I wanted to see if you thought that was a feasible option in the absence of mechanical ventilation. Yeah, again, this is another one where the data are really mixed. Um, and I think, was it the Uganda study that, um, that Tina Slisher and her group did most recently? And I can't remember if it was like a high flow versus bubble CPAP, but essentially, yeah, they found no improvement in outcomes. Um, but previously studies, the previous studies had shown um, improvement in mortality. And there's a... Um, New England Journal of Medicine uh, study from Bangladesh, which looked at high flow, I think, versus bubble CPAP uh, versus mechanical ventilation and did show and improved survival. So again, it like it's it seems to be very specific to the context. And I think that the trial in Uganda was like more pragmatic. Um, so that's why it, you know, it it's more concerning, I think, that um, in terms of like real life application. That being said, um, the I think the technology itself does work for smaller children. You run into um, some some realistic challenges with it, so you have to have a good oxygen source. And many of these hospitals are using oxygen concentrators, so they're limited flow. So they can usually do only a max of ten to fifteen liters. So the amount of positive pressure that you can deliver with that is quite low. And then as you go up on that flow with the oxygen concentrator, you're actually decreasing your FiO2. So it's always this trade off between it. So it's of minimal utility. And then it's typically like only effective for kids that are like small, like less than 10 kilos or so. Um, that being said, for that population, like the neonatal population, I think there is more compelling evidence. Um, and and it, it like it does work in a perfect setting um, or can work in a perfect setting. I think the question is really from like a more realistic implementation perspective. Can we do it in a meaningful way? We did a cost effective analysis on bubble CPAP for severe pneumonia in Malawi and actually showed that it was um, significantly cost effective. So I think it was like mm, maybe $14 for disability adjusted life year saved, which is pretty good. Like vaccines are like $7 and other things that they'll consider are like hundreds of dollars for PEPFAR. So it is like, it's, it is a good technology. I don't think we should throw it out entirely, just be more about when and how to implement it, which is what Hannah is going to figure out with her implement implementation science. Yeah. What's your opinion? I want to know. Uh oh, I lost you. My opinion? Yeah. Tell me what you think of it. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm not sure that I really have one, I guess. I guess I'm I'm more on the the cautious end of it because there's um some literature that suggests that it may not be as effective as as previously thought like you were saying and it may not be entirely safe when um there isn't close monitoring so that's that 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 was kind of my opinion but I figured you're the expert why not ask you Yeah no I think you're right though it's all about you know implementation in a real life setting and doing that well and if you don't do it well, what are the unintended consequences, which is another kind of theme that we've had throughout this course. Um, yeah. Have we also, have we made any progress in portabilizing mirrors? Because I feel like that technology is really awesome and it's so expensive. Um, I don't know. But if you're interested in it, 
there was just a science uh, publication maybe last week or this, I can't remember, within the last like seven days or so on cerebral malaria in NEARS and trying to get at the underlying mechanism, like using NEARS to try to decide if it's cytotoxic edema or um, increased venous congestion. That's out of the, uh, the Blantyre group. So I don't know uh, if we've made any headway on that, but it is an interesting technology. Uh, and then hold on, don't leave yet. I have a, a favor to ask if you guys don't mind filling out the um, link for the survey. Again, I swear it's super short. It's like three so questions. Thank you for a really interesting presentation. I have two questions sort of. Uh, one is uh, how much engagement is there and involvement and input from local clinicians and researchers in some of these uh, studies? Uh, and I ask this because it's kind of nice to sort of to see how the research is going. But um, early on in clinical practice, we used to have like a lot of US-based physicians, residents, consultants coming and, you know, pushing the whole, you know, fluid, more fluid, fluid for sepsis and local physicians, we sort of like understood that it didn't always work intuitively. Mm -hmm. And I remember even like sometimes adjusting orders or local nurses just not giving the full order when given because mm -hmm. knowing that it was not going to have a good outcome. Uh, so that's one question, like, you know, how much input from local staff is going into some of these research? And two, it, when looking at um, some of these other next generation testing, biomarkers and such, again, mm -hmm. the feasibility of that when, you know, we already know like getting a CBC or getting a blood culture, is difficult in such settings and then move jumping sort of to like next generation testing and modalities how feasible is it really still in a resource constrained environment thank you yeah. all good questions so i can't speak to other studies in terms of how like what their community engagement and local env engagement with um partners has been um, but I can I can speak to my experiences and um, I've always worked closely with um, they have a really good mentor in in Tanzania who I've been working with since 2015 and really like the idea for the original projects was um, a bunch of us sitting around the table um, Tanzanian American um, and just seeing like what what are the problems like what what do you want to look at research you know what what do you think could be better or different and then it was a completely like organic process for coming up with the original sepsis project and then from that that kind of led to additional questions which we then are looking at with the um with the current study the next generation sequence feasibility is a good one it comes up often um and it, in part because it's not something that we do routinely even in high resource settings yet Though I will say that it, I think that that's changing. Um, I don't have a good figure for this, but um, the cost of sequencing has, you know, exponentially decreased over the last, um, you know, decade or two. And it hopefully will continue to do that as we get more efficient with the um, technologies. And we do now have a CLIA approved um, test to do next generation sequencing. So there's the carious test um, where you can send it and you can do. Um, uh, I think it's like 600 microliters minimum of um, plasma. And then there's also for a CLIA approved CSF um, next gen sequencing um, test that you can do. So it is actually becoming part of like clinical care and management. Um, the other thing is in terms of feasibility, you know, what, what you primarily need in resource constrained settings is the ability, like the, I think the biggest barrier is to, is to sequence things. Um, and there are, um, you know, there's different levels of sequencers. Um, there's the really like high throughput ones. There's the ones that can do deeper reads and ones that um, are more robust um, and maybe just don't do as deep of reads. Um, and the Gates Foundation has now had two rounds of funding um, to specifically put sequencers in countries 
for the purpose of doing sequencing for pathogen detection and surveillance. And why that works well is because you just need to get the clinical samples there, sequence it locally, and then you can upload it to the cloud and run it um, virtually anywhere in the world. So you only need kind of half of that pipeline to exist in any one place. And again, like there's various levels of sequencing. Um, and if you're just trying to do something like pathogen detection, it doesn't have to be as deep of sequencing as kind of the other, you know, phylogenetic trees, if you, that's what you're trying to do. So if you um, if you want to look, actually, the um, Gates Grand Challenges um, has, I think, a map on their website where they actually have, they have a couple sequencers in East Africa, throughout Asia, and they're trying to, they're trying to make it more feasible. But yeah, definitely still a cost and technology barrier. Thank you. Okay. I'm hungry, so I'm going to end now <laughs> so that we can eat before our next talk at 1230. Um,